Greetings, brothers and sisters. Please remain standing. Ha, 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 ha. Please, everyone, grab your Bibles. Remain standing. Grab your Bible. There you go. Everyone grab your Bibles. Who brought their Bibles today? Raise, your, raise them up. There you go. I'm not doing this to judge the people who didn't bring their Bibles. I'm doing this to encourage the people who did not bring their Bibles. Bring your Bibles, brothers and sisters. It is a good habit. Всегда приносите Библию, Филипп. Принес Библию? Принес, молодец. Слава Богу. Я бы хотел, чтобы мы, во-первых, сперва помолились, братья и сестры. I want us to pray before we, be we begin the main sermon. I'd like us to pray. I'd like us to pray. Why? I want us to be filled with God's word today. I want us to walk out of this room, out of the sanctuary, with something that we can use throughout the week. And with that, let's go ahead and pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this day. I ask that you would bless the rest of the service, that you would bless the word that is going to be preached, that it falls into the hearts of these brothers and sisters, so that it does bear fruit in good time. I pray this in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. You may be seated. Before we continue to open up our Bibles, I want us to make lists, all right? I want us to make lists today. I want us to make one list, actually. And we're going to keep looking at that one list. I didn't bring my whiteboard today. I thought, you know, that's old news. I'll do that another time. So instead, if anyone can take out pieces of paper or even get this, you can take out your phone. Open up the notebook app. And I want us to make a list. What do I want us to make a list of? I want us to make a list of at least four things we wish to accomplish in our life. Four things. Just what are the things that you really want to get done in your life? Give 30 seconds. You can go ahead and write that down. It shouldn't be that hard. Just four things or even two things. What do you want to get done in your life? All right. Everyone wrote that list? Or are you still writing? Miroslav, are you writing that list? Or is it all in your head? It's all in your head. Okay, хорошо. It's all in your head. I'd like us to write this list. I'd, I think it's going to work really well. All right. Now that everybody's pretty much done writing that list, I hope, please open up your Bibles to the book of Proverbs. The book of Proverbs. Book of Proverbs, chapter 3. I'm sure there's a really famous verse or verses that we hear from Sunday school. Proverbs, chapter 3. Proverbs, chapter 3, verse 5, 6, and 7. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5, 6, and 7. It says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto your own, thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Be not wise in thine own eyes. Fear the Lord. Depart. From evil. Really simple words. Really simple phrases stitched together in a very elegant way. On first glance, it's not very sophisticated. It just says, trust in God with everything that you are. Do not depend on your whatever you think is right. Acknowledge God all the time. And never and He will and He will set your path straight. Very simple in layman's terms. The book of Proverbs. If we look at the book of Proverbs from a whole, from just take a step back, the book of Proverbs is a book of wisdom, right? The book of Proverbs is a book of knowledge, gives you instruction on how to do certain things, how to be, how to act, how to behave. And the book of Proverbs also gives us many warnings. The book of Proverbs warns us, young men, to be careful around the kind of women that we associate ourselves with. Sorry, women, I'm not trying to, you know, bash on anyone here, Okay. It gives us warnings. I'm sure all you sisters are really wonderful sisters, okay? I'm saying out there somewhere, all right? And sisters, it gives you also instructions, also warnings. It tells you on how to be a godly woman, right? Wrong, right? 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 Right. There you go. They're right. So with that in mind, we read these three verses, and there's four points that I would like to pull. And they're pretty much the first four phrases of what we've read. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not unto thine own understanding. All thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct your paths. Four things that I want us to take away with today. You can write those things down, and we'll go through each and every single one of them. So the first one, trust in the Lord. In fact, let's even focus on that first word, trust. What do you guys think trust means? Any takers? 
I'd like to hear some feedback. What do you guys think trust is? Anyone? What is trust? Giving up everything just to the Lord. Let's just kind of just мирское понимание trust kind of a thing. Not having to worry about what's going to happen. Anyone from this side? What is trust? When someone says, I trust this or I trust that, what do they mean by trust? They can rely on it. Okay, what else? Any other takers? Trust. What does that mean? From the back, someone. David Blinoff. Trust. Dependence. Loyalty. Reliance. All good synonyms. I uh, took a look in Webster's the uh, 1828 edition, if anyone's curious. And trust is translated as confidence. Would you guys agree? Trust is, is a, a certain level of confidence, right? Yes? Or no? Okay, definitely say yes or no if I ask a question. All right, let's keep going. Trust is confidence. And in fact, I heard, I was listening to a sermon just the other day, and Dr. Scott Pauley says this quote. He says, you trust the people you spend time with. You trust the people that you know love you, right? Right? Or wrong? Right? Right? Yes. Right. That's, let's, let's have a conversation. You're not a monologue, right? You trust the people that you love, and you have learned to love them. Ain't that right? right. You want to know a great example in my life? Someone who I really trust is my wife. Absolutely, that's right. I trust my wife. I know that when I go to a meeting, I know when I go to choir, I know when I go to wherever I need to go, I can trust my wife to make sure that the house is not burned down. I can trust my wife to know that the kids will be well taken care of. They won't be locked out outside with her sitting inside on the couch with their headphones on and them scratching at the door saying, let me in, you know? I mean, maybe I should put a camera up. I don't know. I don't know. Every time I come back, everything seems to be fine. So I don't know. But you trust those people because you love them. And how do you begin to love someone? Any takers? How do you begin to love someone? Oh, you're single. That's right. Next. Oh, I'm just kidding. I'm, kidding. I'm, kidding. I'm sorry, brother. I'm sorry, brother. I just seeing who's paying attention here. How do you learn to love someone? You spend time with them. All right. Wow. So, so many people are going to get married here. How many of you wrote, I want to get married on your list of things that I wrote or asked? Raise your hand nice and high. There's nothing to be ashamed of. I wanted to get married. Nice and high. Higher. Come on, this side. No one wants to get married here? All right, ladies and gentlemen, just focus on all the people here who raised their hand. All right, that's, we have about eight. Pastor Alex, maybe we'll have a sermon about getting married and the benefits and great things about marriage. Everyone here, I'm very concerned, very, very concerned, right? We trust the people, we begin to love them because we spend time with them, right? Now, the next word or character that I want to focus on is the Lord, right? The Lord. It says, trust in who? One more time. Trust in? One more time, a little bit louder. Trust in? The Lord, yes, trust in the Lord. And I'd like us to open up the book of Psalms. Psalms, you guys know that psalm, that book? It's not Psalms, it's not something else, it's Psalms. Please open up Psalms, and I want us to open up Psalm 23. Everybody know that psalm? Or in Russian, I think it's 22, right? Psalm 23 starts with, The Lord is my shepherd. Very nice. And it says, I shall not want. He maketh me lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Ye, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Fill in the blank. A little bit more confidently. You will what? What? That's right. You will fear no evil. Why? For thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me in all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. This is a description of who our God is. Do you imagine the awesomeness of our God. Do you imagine the awesomeness? God is your shepherd. God cares for you so much. He will guide you to all the places that you need to be. God cares for you so much. 
He will go out of his way to move mountains of sin for you. I remember Stanislav uh, Dobush, he was here and he spoke from the pulpit and he said, it's amazing to see when man makes the slightest effort, the slightest movement to get salvation from God, the slightest call for help and the Lord runs, just like a child who is about to go into danger or is hurt and falls, scrapes their knees and starts crying. What do the parents do? They run. They want to see what's going on, right? You guys seen that, yeah? yeah. Or you guys, who's seen that? Anyone see that? Anyone have little nephews or little, little brothers and sisters? And you see how your parents run to them? Or maybe as they grow, as you have more kids, you know, it's like, oh, that's normal. That's fine. It's okay. They're doing all right. I mean, I'm not saying I do that all the time, but sometimes, you know. But the Lord is our shepherd. The Lord cares very deeply for you. The Lord wants to take good care of you. And the Lord does. He's faithful to his promise. The next thing I want us to do is I want us to look at Psalm 24. Let's read Psalm 24. It's 10 verses, right? It says, The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof the world, and they that dwell therein. So what does this tell us about our God? Our God owns everything. He created everything everything. This earth, that, this very earth that we live in, this earth that we look at and we sometimes see how much sin and how much destruction and how much helplessness there is and how much evil is abounding and the sins of man seem to know no boundaries, but God yet still owns this earth. In fact, God is, his, is the shepherd who loves this earth so much that he sent his own son to die, to die for the sins of you and I. And at the end of this psalm, look at what it says. Psalm 24, 7. Lift up ye he ye your heads, all ye gates, and be lift up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is the King of glory? Who is the King of glory? The Lord. What does it say? Strong and mighty. The Lord mighty in battle. Let's try this again. Lift up ye he your heads, O ye gates. Even lift them up. Ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord. The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. Amen, brothers and sisters? Amen. Amen. God is our shepherd. God is the King of glory. God is all-powerful. God is almighty. And this is what Solomon is writing here. He's saying, trust in the Lord. He's not saying trust in a financial institution. He's not saying trust in a social institution. He's not saying trust in a government. Like we often times hear, trust in the U.S. government. Those are the scariest words you can hear on the television if you ever hear them. Trust in someone who you have never met and never seen and they only have done bad things to you. Like make you pay taxes. I'm just kidding, guys. Some people don't think that's funny, okay? Maybe I'm just getting old here, all right? Maybe I'm just getting old. But <clears throat> trust in the Lord. You're trusting in someone who actually knows you very personally. And in fact, we're going to talk about that even more. It says, trust in the Lord with all thine, what? Heart. What is your heart? When the Bible says your heart, or when it mentions that word heart, what does it mean? What is it talking about? Does it talk about the actual physical heart of a person? Anyone? No? Yes? No? Let's hear it. Yes or no? no? No. What is it talking about? Any takers? I'd like to hear from the crowd. What is the Bible talking about when it says the heart of a man? Anyone? What? Your desires. Yes. What else? Your what? Your conscience. Yes, that's a really good word. What else? What? Your soul? Almost. Not quite. Your feelings, your conscience, your desires, all good answers. Not quite so, I'm sorry, but I appreciate the effort. That's good. Your heart, this is what the Bible says about your heart. You guys want to hear what the Bible says about your heart? Anyone know any good verses about your heart from the Bible? It's wicked. That's right. That's right. Genesis chapter 6, if you guys open up Genesis chapter 6, I'll give you guys a second to open it up. Genesis chapter 6, verse 5. I'll set the scene for you. So the fall of man happened. Adam and Eve had many children. There's many people on this earth. And this is the observation that God has for the heart of man. It says, And God saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth, 
and that every imagination, notice it says every imagination, it doesn't say some, it doesn't say half, it says every imagination. Everything that your heart thinks of, what does it say? That every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was evil when? Continuously. Continuously. That's right. The, the imaginations of man's heart was evil all the time. Never once was there a moment, a second, that the imaginations or the thoughts of a man's heart was good. Now imagine that. A God who's all-powerful, who created man, who's done everything, who put man in a garden, who set everything up for man to live happy, eternal, forever. And then man sins, and then he looks at man's heart and he sees that that's all man wants to do. Sin forever. And it seems like whenever we come across some awful thing that we hear of people doing, and you're like, wow, people are so sinful. We just crossed the threshold. How much further can we go? And then a couple weeks later, there's another threshold that we pass. If we thought before that abortions were awful and terrible and people would talk about having abortions at eight weeks, nine weeks, 10 weeks, 12 weeks, 24 weeks, people are talking about having abortions at 37 weeks. Do you guys understand what that is? At 37 weeks, the baby is fully formed and can survive with no equipment outside the womb. Do you understand that? We are living in a world that thinks it's okay to kill children right before birth. The most vulnerable people in our society are under threat. Imagine that. Imagine that. Look in Jeremiah chapter 17. I'll let you guys open up that one. And you can definitely underline this verse. I highly recommend everyone remember this one. It says, Jeremiah 17 verse 9. It says, the heart is, a deceit, is deceitful above all things. Some things? No, everything. And it says, and desperately wicked. Not partially wicked. Not a little bit wicked. Not wicked only on Friday nights when I want to go hang out and have a fun time with my friends and we do some sin together. Or when, we're, when I'm home alone and no one's there to bother me and I can go indulge in some kind of sin that no one knows about. Not just then. Desperately. All the time. Nonstop, the heart of man without God is sinful always. That's all it wants. And it says, who can know it? You think it's a coincidence that when we were all in school and we heard this phrase, follow your heart. Roman, just follow your heart. Dan, follow your heart. Pavel, follow your heart. Follow your passions. Follow your heart. Mark, just follow your heart. Do what you want. Follow your passions. You think it's just by accident that the world thinks to proclaim such a statement? Follow your heart. The Bible gives us clear warning. Don't follow your heart. It will, it will lie to you, and you won't even know it is lying to you. Verse 10, and this is the verse that gives us hope. Check this out. It says, I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. So who's the only one who can understand the heart? The Lord. The Lord. Again, who is the only one who can understand the heart? The Lord. the Lord. Remember that. The only one who knows your heart, the only one who knows what you want is God. No one else. You don't even know that. You can tell yourself that I know exactly what I want. You can tell yourself that, oh, I'm a, I have a good heart. I'm, I'm clean. For those of you who ever evangelize to people, you'll hear them say, I think I have a good heart. Is that right, Roman? Yeah. Is Max Samolenko here? Where is he? He's not here. He didn't make it. But those of you who evangelize, how many of you guys have heard that phrase? I have a good heart. Raise your hand. I want to see that. I'm a good person. I'm a good person. Yeah. You all hear people say that because they are deceived by their own heart. Check it out. How many of you guys wrote down some things? And those things might have involved riches. You don't have to raise your hand. I'm not gonna make you raise your hand. How many of you guys on your list, look at your list again. Those things that you guys wrote down on your list, look at them. Everyone, take out your phones, whatever. Everybody, let's do that. All those things you wrote, what are they? 
For some of those things, maybe I want to get married. Yeah? I want to buy a house. I want to have a career. Anyone write that? Anyone write that they want to have a good career? Raise your hand. There's nothing wrong with that. I want to have a good career. Anyone say that they want to have children? Raise your hand. There you go. That's a good thing to want. Anyone say that they want to get married? There you go. Now little people are warming up to the idea of getting married. Don't worry, brothers and sisters. It's a good thing. Very blessed. It says in Jeremiah 17, 11, As their partridge sitteth on eggs and hatches them not, so he that getteth riches not by right shall leave them in the midst of his days, and his end shall be a fool. If you wrote down those things that you wish to attain to get physical wealth, regardless of how you do it, be sure that you do it properly. Be sure that you don't take any shortcuts or any sleazy ways out and try to acquire wealth. The Bible's really clear about that. You will really quickly end. The next, stand, the next point, lean not unto thine own understanding. Your own understanding. What is it when I say the word, lean not unto your own understanding? What do you guys think? All right, let me hear it. This, these brothers have been very active. I love it. Mr. Gorosh, when it says, lean not unto your own understanding, what do you mean by that? What, what does the Bible mean by that? Not what I think it means, but what does the Bible mean by that? Lean not unto your own understanding. John, help him out. Well, like it says in the verse before, just to trust in the Lord. Okay, we're not going to look at the verse before. We're going to look at that one word, okay? Understanding. What does that mean? Any, any takers? Own knowledge. Your own knowledge, right? Do what you think is right. Doing what you think is right. Miroslav, what do you think that means? You are a PCC graduate. He probably has like a Bible degree or something. He doesn't. Huh. How, we view life. How we view life. That's a good one. David Kopakov, what do you think? When it says, your own understanding. Abner, you're next. I agree with the brothers. How, the way you view it, the way you want it. Okay. All right, in your own words now? <laughs> Just kidding, guys. Yes, that's exactly correct. Lean not on your own understanding. Do not lean on the way you understand life. And you know what? You know what? God has a very different understanding of life than what man or the world, let's just say the world that we live in, has for life. You know, knowledge isn't just knowledge we absorb in school, we absorb at work, we get information, but the heart is where all the decisions happen, right? And check this out. I want us to all open up to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. This is a really good verse. I think you guys will like it. You guys can definitely underline it as well. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Everyone open up their Bibles. Perfect. Verse 18, 19, and 20. Verse 18 says, Let no man deceive himself. If any man among you seemeth to be wise in this world, let him become a fool, that he may be wise. Now, it seems kind of strange, right? We go to school. We acquire knowledge. We acquire experience. We try to grow our know-how. We try to build ginormous resumes, right? Ain't that right, Simon? Right? You're paying attention. That's good. We try to grow our knowledge. We try to get as much stuff as we can into our brains. But then it says right here, if you think you're wise, if you determine or deem yourself as wise, in this world, so according to the world, if you think that you are the smart guy in the room, if you know the answer to everything, if you know the solution to every problem or make every problem a solution or whatever you want to call it, it says let him become a fool. Why? Why does the Bible call us to become fools? Especially, why am I bringing this up when I'm reading from a book that's all about wisdom and knowledge and gaining warnings and living your life properly? Anyone, anyone want to answer that question? What does that mean to be a fool to this world? Anyone? Anyone? Nobody. You know what the Bible says about, about us Christians? That we're fools for Christ. Imagine that. Anyone here want to be a fool? I want to be a fool for Christ. And that's kind of strange, right? That you would think that the person who, who came down to this earth, the one whom all knowledge comes from, that we would look at him and say, that's not a fool. That's the wisest man of all. 
That's not a fool. That's the one who created all the laws of physics. That's the one who created the thing that we call the universe. That's the one who created dark matter. Anyone heard of dark matter? It's the craziest thing in the world. Take some time in your afternoon when you have a minute, after you read your Bible, obviously, and learn about it. It's insane. And we're only discovering it now. But imagine it existed for thousands of years and we had no idea. Anyone ever wonder how the world just suspends into nothing? I'm reading the book of Job, and Job's saying it's God who took the planet Earth and put it and just hung it on nothing. Now imagine that. I can't hang anything on nothing. I take this microphone, I try to hang it on nothing, it's going to fall to the floor, right? You try to get into your car with no gasoline and no electricity, you turn the key, nothing's going to happen, right? We need something to do something. God just speaks, and it happens. Look, it says, for the wisdom of this world, so meaning the knowledge, all the priorities of this world, all the things that our society holds in high esteem, right? All the wokeness, all the LGBTQ, all the stuff that we te they teach in our colleges, they say this is what wisdom is. And we look at it, we laugh, right? Why? For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written, he that taketh the wise to their own craftiness. And again, the Lord knoweth the thoughts of the wise, that they are vain. And I want us to stop on this little thought. The Lord knoweth the thoughts of the wise, and they are vain. If you think what you're doing as a young adult, we're all, you guys are all young adults. I'm still a young adult. I'm only 27, okay? I'm not over 30. I'm sorry, Mr. David's at 30, so I don't know if he qualifies as a young adult anymore, but, you know. Are you still a young adult, David? He's a young adult, okay. If you're younger than Pastor Alex, you're a young adult. Right, Pastor Alex? That's right, that's right, that's right. That's good news for me. I'll be a young adult my whole life. That's good. But it says, <clears throat> something I want us to think about. You're building your life. You're building your plans for your future, right? You say that you want to get married. You say you want to have a career. You say you want to have a job. You say you want to have a wife or a, or a husband. I hope it's the opposite gender, obviously. I hope, you know, you want to have children. You want to build a life. You want to build something here on earth. Yet you want to do it with what wisdom? Under whose guidance? The world will tell you one thing. God who created the family will tell you something entirely different. King Solomon. I heard the sermon about King Solomon. King Solomon was a wise fool. This preacher, Dean Miller. He categorized Solomon as a wise fool. You know why he, he, why he labeled Solomon as a wise fool? Anyone want to answer that question? No. He was a wise fool because he squandered more wealth and more power and more prestige than anyone who's ever walked this earth. Imagine that. Imagine being so rich. Imagine being so powerful that silver, pure silver, is the same level as a rock. Can you imagine that? Just holding pure silver in your hands and it's worth dirt. Just pick it up and throw it. This means nothing. Imagine being so rich and so powerful that you can probably, in today's money, buy all of the industries. Buy the oil industry outright. Buy defense industry. Buy tech. Imagine buying Amazon, Apple, and Microsoft and just ruling it. And you're still fine. And you, you, it didn't even dent your pocketbook. You have so much gold you don't even know what to do with. You have so much power you don't know what to do with. Imagine being the greatest governor who's ever walked the earth, and in his lifetime, he lost it. I want us to open up the book of Ecclesiastes, please. Let's open up the book of Ecclesiastes. It's right after Proverbs. Oh, Song of Solomon. Where are we? It's right after Proverbs. Apologies. Book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 1. This is the writings of Solomon. He's lived a life. He's seen more than we can ever imagine. He's known more than we can ever have desired to know. And this is his verdict at the end of his life. Verse 2. Vanity of vanities, 
saith the preacher, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. You guys know what the word vanity means? A waste. A waste of time. It doesn't matter. It's pointless. I've devoted my life to something that matters not. And Solomon is writing these things as a warning to each and every single one of us here today. We can build a plan. We can build a life. We can do everything that we think is right. We can do everything that the world tells us to do. But at the end of it all, we're left with nothing. Check it out. He goes further. Verse 14. If, oh, I need to flip the page here. But it says, verse 14. I have seen all the works that are under the sun. He's not lying here. He's literally seen everything that there is to see. And behold, all is vanity. If there's someone here today that thinks there's something out there that brings them joy, that is not God, listen to the words of Solomon. Solomon is going to die soon. Solomon at this point in his life probably fell to idols. Solomon at this point in his life is not walking with God like David was. And in fact, God has had enough of Solomon sinning. He told Solomon that in your lifetime, or this kingdom that you have built, that went all the way to the Euphrates River. You guys know how far that is? Open up your maps if you'd like to. Take a look. From the Euphrates River all the way down to the Nile, that entire stretch of land, that was all Solomon's. That's probably now, what, five, six countries at the moment. And they are never getting along, probably. And he owned all that. He said, 15, that which is crooked cannot be straight, and that which is wanting cannot be numbered. I communed with mine own heart, saying, Lo, I have come to great estate. I have gotten more wisdom than all they that have been before me in Jerusalem. Ye, my heart hath had great experience in wisdom and knowledge, and I gave my heart to know wisdom and to know madness and folly. I perceived that this is also vexation of the Spirit. For in so much wisdom is much grief, and he that increaseth in knowledge increaseth in sorrow. By no means, I think, Solomon is saying ignorance is bliss. Don't interpret that verse as that. This, this is not an excuse for you to not learn anything. This is not an excuse for you to ignore any knowledge or any wisdom that's passed along to you. Absolutely not. There's something much greater here. And I wrote down in my notes, I said, Solomon had great things to boast about. He had how many women? A thousand. Guys, a lot of us struggled just to get one. I was there. It was hard, okay? He had a thousand. He had millions and billions and probably trillions worth in our, of, of wealth in our dollars today. He had more land than we can imagine. You guys know the largest private landowner right now in the United States? You know who that is? Warehouser. Warehouser owns more than a million acres of forest land. I work for that company. It's a great company. It's nice. But imagine having even more than that. Imagine having so many houses you don't even know what to do with. There may be some of us here tonight that work on construction. We see all these different houses. Now imagine owning all of Medina or Medina. Is it Medina or Medina? Medina. Imagine owning all the houses in Medina. All you guys who do construction, you know who that is, right? What that is, all right? All the nicest places in Bellevue and Kirkland. Imagine owning that. Imagine owning all of Mercer Island. It's all yours. You have so many houses you don't even know what to do with. You have one for each one of your wives. A thousand houses for a thousand wives. That's all what Solomon had. But he failed to do this very next thing. And this is really important. Solomon failed to acknowledge God in all his ways. And when I was thinking about what does that mean to acknowledge God, how do you, how do you be a Christian and acknowledge God? And I thought of these two types of Christians that can exist. There's two types. There's compartmentalized Christians and there's passionate Christians, right? Compartmentalized Christians, you know what they do in their life? They compartmentalize. It means they draw lines of where God can go and where God cannot or they think they can, rather. They deceive themselves. They lie to themselves. Because their heart tells them that, hey, you know what? Your money? You don't need to put God there. What you do with your friends? 
when the parents aren't looking, when they're out of town, when you guys are alone and you're trying to have a good time, God doesn't need to be there. That's outside of where God needs to be. You know where God needs to be? For, in church, when you're in church, when you're on Sunday, you come in, you dress nice, you say the right things. You know, you come on Easter service, you say, Christos was kres, Vaisno was kres. On Christmas, you say, you sing all the wonderful carols and, and hymns that we sing. We think that's, we can do that. But that's, that's not the case at all. It's impossible to do that. In fact, we deceive ourselves if we can do that. Believers, you know, we like to say, be a believer in deed and in speech. But I'd like to add two more things. Believers must not be just in word or in attire, so the way we dress, or in our deeds. Believers, or real believers, must be in spirit too. They must also have the Holy Spirit to be real believers. That's important. Us Slavic Baptists, I don't know about you guys, we love to brag about how much works we do. We like to say that, oh, I'm busy every single day of the week. I'm in church every single day of the week. Monday I got this, Tuesday I got that, Wednesday is midweek service, Thursday is choir, Friday is Bible study, we're some orchestra, we're Russian school, Saturday I'm doing something else with my family, Sunday I'm in Sunday school or, or whatever else. We like to be busy. We like to think that I can be busy and that's going to be good enough for me. We like to think that I can have tons and tons of ministries but not spend time with the Lord in prayer. We love talking about how busy we get. But don't let your busyness get in the way of your midweek services on Wednesdays. Because God speaks on Wednesdays too. Don't let your busyness get in the ways of Saturday services. Because Saturdays, God speaks there too. What about Sunday evening services? I understand that a lot of you guys sometimes visit four services on a Sunday. But you know what? Imagine if you went on morning, noon, evening, and you didn't hear God say anything to you then. Maybe God wanted to say something to you today in this service. I was just, when I was, I was just in a um, youth leaders retreat for the association. It's a really good fellowship. And one of the pastors there, when they were talking about ministry, they said, your ministry, or you were called for, you called for service, not for success. We like to think that if our ministry is successful, it will somehow support my spiritual condition. It will somehow bring me closer to God. I will rejoice and I will worship God more. No. If you want to be successful in your ministry, you want to be successful in your plans in life, you need to find time to pray. You need to find time to dig into your Bible. I remember Wayne Johnson was here and he was talking about Bible studies. He was like, the first thing you need to do in a Bible study or to, get, to read your Bible, is you need to actually study it. You don't just come and read, you know, Ecclesiastes chapter 2 or chapter 1, or Proverbs chapter 3, and be like, all right, I'm done. Close your Bible, and off you go. No, study it. Dig into it. Dig into it. And then there's passionate Christians. Christians who really do love God. Christians that follow God. Christians that do not compartmentalize. They open up the doors to their heart, and they say, God, do whatever you want. Start the greatest remodeling project of, of all mankind in my heart. Rip out all the walls. Rip out all the electricity that I have tried to wire, and it's very dangerous. Rip out everything and start anew. Make a new heart of me. Change my desires. Change my hearts. I don't want you to just be in church with me, and then when I leave the church and go with my friends, or when I'm home alone with my phone and looking at all kinds of ungodly things, I want you to be there too, stopping me. That's what real Christians want. I want us to open up one more, a couple more spots that I'm going to have you guys open up. First Peter. Open up the book of First Peter, chapter 5. First Peter, chapter 5. And this is going to bring us to the last point. He shall direct thy paths. There's a verse for you guys. A couple, actually. Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject to one another and be clothed with humility. It's a wonderful illustration there. Clothed with humility. What do you guys think that looks like? 
What do you guys think being clothed in humility looks like? Anyone want to answer that question? Clothed in humility, Igor. What does that look like? It surrounds you fully, okay? You can see that you have humility. Well, that's an oxymoron, but okay. We don't talk about that. <laughs> what does that look like? Clothed in humility. Maybe some of our... When you realize you're completely broken, there's nothing you can do on yourself. There's nothing. You try and you try and you try. You repent once, twice, three times, 10 times, 20 times. Every youth conference, you make a rededication of your life. You say, God, I'm going to read my Bible every day. I'm going to pray for you every day. And then you come home on Monday and you forget it all. And it's as if you've never been to a youth conference. Just like today's service, many of us rededicated our lives to the Lord. And praise the Lord for that. I definitely hope we pray at the end for those for those souls from our youth and in our church who took a step and said, you know what, I don't want to live this sinful life anymore. I want to be God's. Clothe yourself in humility. Understand that you, who was unable to understand and know the ins and outs of your heart, have no place in attempting it to bring it under rule. Clothed in humility is understanding your complete absence of strength and ability to rule your own life. Because when you try to do it by yourself, you know what happens? You get overrun with your own sinful desires. When you try to rule your own life outside of God, without God, you are going to last only so long. 6 and 7 of 1 Peter chapter 5 says this, Humble yourselves, Therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. And here's the question. You want to trust the Lord? Yes? You want to trust the Lord? Who here wants to trust the Lord? You want to trust the Lord? Wow, so many people. This brings a joy to my heart. Do you, you want to acknowledge him always? You want to make him make a path for you? Surrender him, surrender yourself to him. Humble yourself under his mighty hand. God is waiting for you to fall on your knees. God is waiting for you to say, God, I can't do this anymore. I am stuck. I'm chained to the sin that can't let go of me. I hide in the closet. I look at pornography. I cheat. I lie. I don't pay taxes or whatever other sin you might have. I'm a liar. I'm a two-faced Christian. And I don't know how to get free. And when you fall on your knees and you say, God, I need your help. I can't do this without you. I've tried. I've done all the things that I was recommended. I got the flip phone. I take the cold showers. I, I, I make sure my phone is in the other room. I don't, I don't even hang out with my bad friends anymore. But my sins are still right here. They're all in my mind. I can still see them. I still want to do them. I'm still pulled towards them. It's an addiction. I can't get free. Fall on your knees and cry for help. God will run to you. But you ask with faith. I want to return to that wonderful, uh, wonderful quote that I said. You trust the people who you spend time with. You trust the people that you know love you and the ones that you have learned to love. Spend time with the Lord. Learn to love him. He loves you already. He's done everything for you. Look at your list now, one last time. I want us to look at our lists. And I hope after this sermon we can, you might seem this, think this is ridiculous, but cross off every single one of those items. You might say, James, but I, I want to get married. I want to I wanna have a nice life. I want to have a good house. I want to I wanna find a good spouse, and I want to have children, and all these wonderful things that we all really want. I really hope we can cross all those things off and instead write something else. And this is going to be my call to action and my challenge to you. Write something else. And at the very top of your list, I hope you write, accomplish that which God has planned for me. And that's only possible 
when you can wake up, you can talk to God in the morning, hear what he has to say, and when troubles and trials hit you, you can say, I'm not worried. Why? Because I talked to God this morning and he said it's going to be all right. I heard him tell me that everything's going to be all right, that there's nothing that can go wrong here. Yes, it's going to be difficult. I want to share a little story before I finish. Why am I saying all these things? Because I too was once someone who had a plan. I went to college. I wanted to get married. I got married, praise the Lord. I wanted to have children. I have children. I wanted to buy a house. I bought a house. I wanted to do all these things. And you might say, James, you're bragging. No. I'm sharing that I had all these great plans for myself. I thought I would continue to work in my career and I would get raises and I would get promotions and I would retire early and I would do all these things that I really wanted to do, acquire this massive amount of wealth. And then maybe then, maybe then, when I'm in my 40s and I've said goodbye to my career, I can dedicate myself really to ministry, really dedicate myself to ministry, really start caring for the church, really find out what the needs of the church are. And then at the end of August, I got laid off. And that puts a, a, a stop in everything that you thought you were doing. And I thought even after that layoff, I was like, you know, I'll find a job really quick. I'm a smart guy. I have some experience. I'm not fresh. I have a good resume. I can write a cover letter. I'm, in a week or two, I'll be right back in, in shape. It's been two and a half months, almost three. And you're just looking back and you're like, wow, I trusted myself. I leaned on my own understanding. And I hope today we can look at these things in our life. Look at our plans. Cross them all out and say, God, I want to do what you want me to do. I want to stop living for myself and live for you. And may we have strength to do that. Again, let's read that, that first verse again. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Be not wise in thine own eyes. Fear the Lord, and depart from evil. Amen. Let us pray.